In this video, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of how to implement the real world problem scenario. In the last video, we talked about how to write a clear and ill-structured problem statement, and we looked at examples of previous real world problem scenario statements to help guide you and your business partner in selecting and forming your own problem statement for the classroom. At this point, you may not have met with your business partner yet. However, sometimes it's helpful to start at the end as we do in backwards design. Starting with the end in mind can help you and your business partner when forming your problem statements. Before we begin, it's important to understand that there is no wrong way to implement the real world problem scenario. There are no problem scenario police who are going to come to your classroom and see if you're doing it correctly. The most important thing is to engage your students in solving authentic and meaningful problems. So while we're going to present a few options, ideas, examples, it's critical that you understand that you can tweak this and tailor this to make it work for you. As an educator myself, I've done the real world problem scenario multiple times in multiple different ways. I've done it as a one day event a three week long unit, and as a one week wrap up that connected to a larger unit. One of the teachers in a partner district in Colorado used the real world problem scenario over the whole semester in a government class. That teacher was paired with a former state representative and the problem that they presented to students to solve was simply balance the Colorado state budget. <laughs> Next, we hear from Lauren Copen, sports medicine and exercise science instructor at Washington T County Career Center, about her experiences with the real world problem scenario in her classroom. My name is Lauren Copen, and I teach sports medicine and exercise science at the Washington County Career Center. And this coming year, if I participate, will be my sixth year in uh, the problem solving scenario class. The very first one I used was in physical therapy or athletic training. Sometimes the physician will just send you a script with right shoulder pain. So the students got a script and it had right shoulder pain on it for a athlete that was going to go through um, an evaluation and rehab. And that was their ill-structured problem, which is a very real world problem when a physician only gives you pain and doesn't really give you a diagnosis of what is causing the pain. The first time Justin came in in our problem solving scenario was he went through what his career pathway was. And then we went over what a mock interview might look or not interview, an evaluation might look like when working with a client. So the students could hear the same vocabulary that we're working with, the same motions that we do and the same tests that we do to make them feel comfortable in their knowledge that Justin had the same knowledge as them. And then the second time he came in with the prescription and the students worked in groups to figure out what you should do when you get a script like this. We kind of made it like a real world physical therapy clinic when a patient would present to you with just a script and then you kind of have to figure out what to do next. I have a unique um, classroom time so it's three hours long and we took that whole three hours in just one um, classroom period to go through the whole problem solving scenario. Um, the kids presented what they did and Justin kind of picked what one was the best that he thought in what would be the best route that a physical therapist athletic trainer would take to figure out the problem. Um, facilitate more than teach or guide. Um, the students will want that information from you and you really have to prevent yourself from giving them more than you should. Um, sometimes it may not go the direction you thought it would, but that's okay because they're really learning how to problem solve. And sometimes you as a teacher have done it the same way for so many times that they might have a unique and different perspective and you'll really learn from them as well. For the problem scenario, most teachers choose to arrange their students into groups. 
For my problem scenarios in my classroom, the students are acting as a problem-solving firm. The business is our client, and I am the CEO or project manager, making sure that my firm meets the client deadlines. Each of the student groups can then present a unique solution developed collaboratively. In some iterations of the problem scenario, I've even made it a competition between groups, and whoever the business client picks as the best solution wins a prize. However, some teachers choose to put each student group in a different perspective or a different approach to solving the problem. This works well for especially complex problems. I'll give you an example. One of the problems on our website comes from Marietta Memorial Hospital. The problem is that a bus has just crashed in Marietta and there are dozens of people who need treated for life-threatening injuries. The teacher using this problem scenario in her classroom decided to assign all the students to separate roles to consider in the problem. For one group, they were assigned the problem of handling family members of the injured. Another group was assigned the perspective of staffing and medical professional needs. Another group was assigned the problem from the perspective of the other emergency medical teams that would be working with the hospital on the problem. A fourth group was assigned the perspective of hospital administrators needing to get supplies from other parts of the hospital to serve the injured people. And lastly, one student group handled the PR surrounding the hospital's capacity to treat injuries of that nature. Even if you decide not to group your students, the problems can still be solved by students individually. Like we said before, it's entirely up to you to decide what works for your classroom and problem-based learning is flexible. Once you decide whether you'd like to, students to work in groups or whether you are going to choose the groups or let your students decide their own groups, there is a three-step approach that we use to implement the problem. The first phase is helping students understand the problem. The second phase is facilitating the exploration of the problem through the curriculum. And the third phase is resolving the problem. You can spend as much time as you think necessary in each of the phases. And it's important to know that this is not a completely linear process. Sometimes the students think they understand the problem and move on to exploring the curriculum, only to find out they need to go back to understand the problem more deeply before they can jump to solutions. In real life situations, the process is rarely linear, and this can be frustrating, but by using this in the classroom with the support of a teacher, we help the students build resiliency around problem solving in their own lives. The first phase of understanding the problem includes pre-teaching skills and standards. Before I introduce the actual problem to the students, I like to teach them basic skills that I know they will use along the way. For example, I'm an English teacher, so before I introduce the problem to my students and embark on this creative application of skills, I like to review research skills, citation skills, argument, and nonfiction texts. Some teachers, especially math teachers who implement the problem scenario, find that they don't need to pre-teach the skill and that they can integrate the skill as part of exploring the curriculum phase. Again, it's completely your discretion as a teacher where that fits best in the process. Also involved in the phase of understanding the problem is introducing the students to the business. Remember that our ill-structured problems appear very simple. Because they are short, students might feel that they are easy to solve. I find that one of my biggest tasks in this phase is helping students to think through the complexities not stated directly in the problem statement. Through visiting the business's webpage, finding news articles about the business, the students learn about the business and what it does in the local community. The last part of this phase includes getting the students ready to engage with the business partner. I have the student groups brainstorm questions that they might want to ask the business partner related to the problem or related to the business in general. I also have the students fill out a KWL chart to get them ready for the business partner's visit. 
they will use this KWL chart when the business partner arrives to jot down notes and other important pieces of information as they actively listen to the partner's presentation. In the second phase of solving the problem, students explore the curriculum through generating solutions, researching, using content area knowledge, and using the business partner as a resource. For my classroom, I find doing a whole class brainstorm about possible solutions right after the business partner's visit helps to get the energy going. I have the students write down as many possible solutions as they can think of, and we throw them all up on the whiteboard so that everyone's creativity can be inspired. Then, as they begin researching, they can slowly illuminate the ideas that are not feasible or tweak ideas into better iterations. As the students begin to work on the solution in earnest, I find it helpful to do mini lessons interspersed during the group's work time. As my students were thinking of solutions, I found that they were missing some obvious choices. So I did a mini lesson on how to research what businesses in similar situations have done to solve the same problem. We talked about comparing and contrasting situations and how to judge if a solution that had worked in one place might work for our local area. I did another mini lesson on how to use surveys and focus groups to support a solution. Many of my students even designed survey questions that they administered to their family, friends, and other community members to develop their solutions or to support their already good idea. And finally, in preparation for the final phase, presenting the solution, we reviewed presentation skills, styles, and public speaking skills. In addition to exploring the curriculum and building content knowledge, one of the things that Problem Scenario does is help students build professional skills. Three of the skills that employers say graduating students lack are the ability to plan for long-term projects, the ability to work in a group of people from diverse backgrounds, and being able to receive authentic feedback and respond to criticism. Part of the way that some of our teachers decide to approach the problem scenario is by having the students create their own timeline for completion. Some of our teachers present the groups with a blank calendar, with blank squares for work days, and with the business partner's return day filled in. Then, to help students with planning for long-term projects, the students set goals every day and set their own deadlines for smaller chunks of the project. When I did this in my classroom, I took a whole class period for students to think through the process of what they would need to do to complete the solution. They worked on setting goals and deadlines for themselves as a group. Usually in classrooms, the teacher paces the projects or longer assignments. So the students have experience with this sort of deadline, but they lack the experience of pacing the project for themselves. This is an example that one group put together to meet their own deadlines and goals. This is an example of a teacher that used a shorter timeline, but the same idea. The students had to set daily goals and pace themselves for the re-arrival of their business partner, the client who is expecting to hear solutions. Next, we have Abby Campbell, an ag teacher at Fort Fry and she will share her experience with implementing the real world scenario in her classroom. My name is Abby Campbell and I am a high school agricultural education teacher at Fort Fry in Washington County. I had two different ones. So my first one was helping students to determine the profitability and the market response to growing industrial hemp in our community. Uh, I teach a plant and animal science class, and so they were focusing on that new um, legislation in agriculture and what the community would think about it and also what the profit margins were. And then my second problem scenario project was based around agricultural careers, which was with my introduction to agriculture course, and their mission was to figure out how can we actively recruit students who have non-traditional agricultural backgrounds and make them aware of these agricultural careers and opportunities that are available to them. So before the speaker would come into class, I would kind of provide some background to the experience that we are about to have and 
teach any content or background needed. So for example, with my students who were doing the hemp project, we spent about a day just looking at, you know, Governor DeWine had just allowed the planting and harvesting of industrial hemp on January 1st of this year. So we looked at some of that legislation, looked at some of the news articles related to that, kind of became aware that it was a current event and a current issue. And then of course, in that class, we had been studying plant anatomy, um, plant nutrients, all that required for a plant to grow because that was part of my curriculum anyway. And so just kind of purposely implementing the problem scenario at a time that best fit my pacing guide. Um, we also spent some time talking about some soft skills. So this is more important with my intro to ad class. I was doing the ad careers project. How do we act when we have a guest speaker? How do we ask a good question? How do we best represent our school and ourselves? Prefacing them with, this is how you act because they don't, they haven't had that experience before. And it's something that we might not think twice about, but just preparing them with those soft skills is gonna really, one, give them something that's gonna last way past the problem scenario project, but also make them more prepared for it in general. I then put them in groups. I knew my students pretty well at that point in the year. And so I put them in purposeful groups based on skill set and abilities. And I also wanted the students to have specific roles within their group. Um, and so I had, I'm looking at my notes from last year, like the note taker, the um, person that was mainly responsible for the actual construction of the presentation, um, people that were kind of the investigators as far as asking me questions, reaching out to the person that had brought the problem to us. And so they had like a list of roles that I expected that group to fulfill. And the first day after they met in their cohorts and figured out what was the main roles each of them was going to play. And they also received a blank calendar, which was the length of time that they had to work on the project. Um, and so my freshman class, they only had about two weeks versus my upper level plant and animal science. We drag it out for three and a half um, because I expected them to do a lot more work than the freshman class. And I wanted it to take longer for them. Um, so after they had the blank calendar and they made their own deadlines, um, and I made it clear, you know, this is what I was expecting, you know, a presentation that had been rehearsed, a handout, um, you know, a research page, a graphic organizer. And so all that was put together, you know, in a packet on the first day, they worked out, made their timelines, made their group roles. And then I got a copy of their calendar and their roles so that my job was to be their accountability partner. Um, so I would have at minimum weekly meetings with each group to go over their progress and see if they're on track to reach their deadlines that they had set for themselves. And if they weren't, um, why? And that's a life skill that we all experience. We have a deadline coming up we might miss. Uh, so how do you handle that when you have that type of situation and, and how do you get back on track? As we went throughout, sometimes we would uh, have a content day. So we would have like a gap in knowledge that I realized we might have. Um, so for example, with my freshman class, we had to have a day about good research. <laughs> what are reputable sites? Where can we go to find good information? Because I started to see some of these really wonky statistics and facts showing up. And I wasn't quite sure, you know, where that was coming from. So how do you tell a good website? How do you take good notes? How do you properly cite something that you've taken from the internet? Uh, just so that was a filler that I didn't realize I needed until I started. And there was other instances too where I would notice some confusion or maybe something going a different direction than I intended. And so we would have a regroup day and kind of fill in the gaps there. I made sure that they all had a chance to run through the presentation in front of me before we had our uh, guests come back into the classroom. I made sure that they had handouts. We talked about presentation skills. So you read and present more than what is on the slide behind you. Um, you know, dress professionally in a way that makes sense for, you know, our students and where they're at, um, you know, asking if there's any questions, thanking people for your time afterwards, really putting the best foot forward with that presentation and um, making it the real deal. And so I had invited like our principal to come down and kind of hyped it up a little bit to make it more exciting, not just for them, but also for our guests to feel like they got to, you know, connect with students and administration and for me too, because 
I was really excited and proud of the project and I felt like the students took a lot of ownership and so getting them that opportunity uh, was exciting for all of us and I felt like it was a good use of time to, to be spending on our problem scenario project. The final phase is resolving the problem, presenting the solution, and reflecting. Especially if you decide to do your problem scenario all in one day, your students might not have a polished presentation. And like we said in the previous video, that's not entirely the point of problem-based learning. Though many teachers do assign a formal presentation component for their students when the business partner returns. However you plan the problem scenario in your classroom, the students will have an enriching, holistic learning experience. There's something almost magical about what happens when we bring community members into a classroom. I know it sounds hokey, but intergenerational learning and helping students learn about what goes on in their own backyard engages them in a way and produces results in a way that no other project has in my classroom. Through the problem scenario, students have a direct impact on their community, and more often than not, this one piece of engagement leads to further community engagement in the students' lives. When we meet, I'll be talking about specifics of evaluation and rubrics.